So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to ITDI. Uh, my name is Phil, and I'm very happy to be hosting. Uh, we've had some short introductions in the forums already, so it's great to have connected with some of you already. Uh, we'll be back in there later as well. Uh, great to see you guys also chit-chatting in there as well. Uh, we are here, of course, for evaluating digital materials with Pete Sharma. And just before I bring him in and hand over the reins to Pete, I'm just going to orientate you a little bit so that you can get an idea of where you are in Zoom. Um, just before I do that, I was just wondering uh, if there's a quick um, digital show of hands in the chat. Can you just let me know with a yes or no if you've used Zoom before? So I think a yes. Okay. A yes from Angela and Catherine. Uh, had a yes from Sue earlier, Louise. Okay, no, it's very straightforward. Just to let you know if you've not used Zoom before. Uh, a lot of teachers have switched to using Zoom for teaching online. I used to use Skype, for example, but Zoom's easier to use, got more functionality, and uh, is also more stable. So that's been a good one. Okay, so mostly got some yeses in. Uh, but there's always new things we can find out about Zoom from each other as well. So just to let you know, uh, down the bottom, if you hover your mouse down the bottom, you see a chat icon. Uh, if you click on the chat icon, if you haven't already, you can open the chat. And then the chat window that opens up, you can move around. And you can adjust the size from... Uh, grabbing the bottom left corner or the bottom right corner. Uh, the default will probably show that you have Pete's PowerPoint showing uh, almost on your full screen or it'll be a bit overlapping with your chat and video. So one thing that you can do is if you go to the top of your screen, then you will see the green sign saying you are viewing Pete Sharma's screen. To the right of that, there is a view options and you can click on the drop down arrow. So the view options menu at the top of the screen next to you are viewing peak numbers green in green. And I've set mine to 50%, which gives me enough room around his slides to stick video and the chat so I can see everything comfortably. Okay, do I have any questions at this stage? Okay. Feel free to drop anything in the chat if you need some help. I can help you on the side as well. Um, that's quite straightforward so far, I think. Right. You can also, just to let you know, then take your video. Um, you'll see the kind of the different, uh, probably see multiple videos on. And you can choose uh, from what option you see, whether you see, for example, yourself or you see just the main speaker. Uh, what I recommend doing is you hover over the video of Pete and you'll see three dots appear for a menu in the top right corner. If you click on that, you can then choose to pin his video. So I'm going to Pete's video. I'm hovering over the screen now and there's a little blue box with three dots. I click on there and I can pin his video so that he will be on top. And then I choose the size. Just trying to sort my size out too. And you can also choose to hide your video if you want. So as you wish. Okay. So hopefully everyone is set up and comfortable. So with no further ado, I shall would like to welcome Pete Sharma 
who is our um, he's back here for a second time with ITDI and we've actually got to know him over the years and been very happy to do so. Uh, those of you who've met Pete before are very familiar with his charm and calm or safe space online and he will be uh, here to help us for the next four weeks as we evaluate digital materials. So over to you Pete. Thank you very much uh, to uh, to you, Phil, and um, welcome to everybody. I'll say welcome from uh, the UK, which is where I am at the moment, and I'm speaking to you from Rochester here, where, as you can see, we have a, a lovely castle and a lovely cathedral. Uh, it's not Rochester, New York. Uh, it's Rochester here, uh, as you can see from that map, not too far from London, and um, Rochester's famous for a writer, and it's not Jane Eyre, Eunice, I'm afraid, but uh, feel free to keep guessing, everybody. Um, just down the road is... Let me just wait one second, welcoming to Nadia. Hello from Morocco. Okay, any guesses for the writer? Okay, there you go. It's not Charlotte Bronte either, it's Charles Dickens. And uh, if you're interested in Dickens, you might like to come here one day and uh, you can see there in the middle of the screen, Restoration House, uh, which for a very young Charles Dickens was the inspiration for the, uh, the house in great expectation. So it's a nice uh, little place just tucked into, the, into Kent. I've been so lucky in my English language teaching career to have visited a large number of countries. That will just give you an idea of some of the uh, places that I've been to. And it's great to be here to welcome uh, people on our course. Uh, you can see South America there, um, European contingent, uh, Morocco, Thailand, Malaysia should also be in screaming white, uh, I think, because of uh, Eunice is here. And um, so it's just always thrilling, I think, to run this kind of course, knowing um, that the participants just come from so many different parts of the world. I think it's one of the most fantastic uh, things about doing online uh, webinars like this. Um, the next slide will just give you an idea of some of the things that I'm involved in. And you notice in red in the middle, uh, it says teach trainer. And that's really why I'm sitting here uh, as a teacher trainer. But I do many other things, um, such as EAP, English for Academic Purposes. And I'm lucky to be a book reviewer because it means that uh, every week, new books arrive in my house and have done over the last 20 years which has helped me to keep up to date with a lot of um, a lot of ELT uh, published materials so please come and have a look at my library if you're ever over here in the UK. Um, I'm an author and that was the very first book that I wrote. Very frustrated I was at the time because there wasn't any material for teachers about CD-ROMs. So that takes me back and since then um, I've been lucky enough to be involved in writing a lot of books, particularly about uh, digital materials. And so that's, if you like, the, um, the books that I've been involved in uh, over the years. So let me first state the aims of this particular course. Uh, the very first aim is to provide um, a systematic approach to evaluating digital materials. And I think that what's out there is anything but systematic. It's extremely messy. There are lots and lots of things everywhere. So if you like, the course is an attempt to impose some kind of order just to help us to see our way through. So we'll be trying over the four weeks to work systematically through the what, the why, the who, and the how of evaluation. So that's the first aim. And the second, to present um, tools, evaluating uh, evaluation tools, frameworks, and so on, so that when you come to evaluate digital materials, you can actually move in and, and actually select the right tool uh, for you. Uh, so your, um, uh, your choices are appropriate and informed. Um, I hope during the whole of the uh, course that you yourselves as participants will choose and, um, 
a set of materials to evaluate. Uh, and, and also, I hope you'll post the results of your evaluation onto our forum so we can all benefit from reading through the evaluations and noticing which ones are very different to how you might evaluate something. I think that'll be fascinating. And lastly, to actually link the research to what we're doing. I think it's very, very easy in our lives, if you are a practitioner, just to rush around and uh, be involved in our day-to-day -day teaching lives, but actually being able to pull back and move more into research. So it's wonderful to um, welcome Taya Dira from Venezuela, who I met out in Venezuela, very much works in a, a university context, and will be able to uh, help us to strengthen that uh, link the bridge, if you like, between research and practice. So I'll show that slide again uh, in four weeks' time, I hope, and we can look back and actually see, did we uh, achieve the aims? And I very, very much hope that we, that we do. Okay, so the course is about evaluating uh, digital materials. That's the espoused goal, uh, but there might be lots of accidental things that happen. For instance, this course is not about writing materials. It's not about writing digital materials. But I bet you, accidentally and incidentally, we actually all learn a little bit more about writing and designing materials, because if we're evaluating them, that might happen. It's not a course which presents to you guys the whole range of digital materials which exist. It's not about that. But again, I bet you, over the uh, course, we will just see, oh my goodness, I've never heard of that. We'll just learn, uh, incidentally, about digital materials. So I'd just like to stress it's quite an innovative course. It's really cutting edge in that this course has never been run before. So yeah. it's not like taking a course off the shelf and saying, here you are. We'll be co-creating the course, myself and you guys. Um, so there will be rocky moments. There'll be times where we might not find a suitable evaluation sheet. We might find that we actually invent and create a sheet to help um, evaluate a set of digital materials. So let's take a look now at the whole course as it presents itself. Uh, this introductory webinar is very much to look at the background, uh, how, why the course exists, and then just to home in on what evaluation is and just share a few ideas of what we think are digital materials. And just before we finish, we are going to go back in time and actually just look very, very briefly. This is the shortest ever history of dig uh, digital materials, but we will do that to give a historical perspective. Next week, we're going to jump sideways into a very, very dark, murky area, the area of theory. So make sure you're fed and watered before we start next week. The area of research, not my area, but I'm uh, going to give it a go and look at different kinds of approaches to evaluation. Week three, the nuts and bolts, what, who, why and how. And then we'll finish off week four by summarizing the many, many, many <laughs> challenges that we face when we evaluate digital materials. Hopefully finish off on a slightly positive note with five, the 10 practical tips and then go into that amazing uh, area of the future, what's happening now, which is absolutely incredible, I think, in the area of uh, digital materials. So I do hope you uh, enjoy uh, this um, course. I hope you enjoy this session where we're going to look, as I say, at the background, evaluation, what digital materials are, and then a history of digital materials. The aim, of course, also is to get to know each other in this online environment. So it's been great to see uh, people's faces there. Uh, that's me. I was just at the ITEFL conference uh, in Liverpool. And um, so was Sue Anan, who, who is uh, here at uh, I want to say this afternoon, but she's here now, whatever time that is for you. Um, so it's great to meet her in real life. And I've met a number of people in real life. And it's lovely to know that we'll meet after this course. So let's kick off 
now with the background to this course and I've thought a little bit about this why does this course exist now uh, in April 2019 and I think as I look back over my uh, I have to say long ELT career um, there were definitely three moments that stand out um, in terms of critical incidents and I'd just like to talk you through those now here's the very first one this incident uh, I blogged about and what I find very surprising if you go to a search engine and type evaluating digital materials can you believe this might actually be the first return that you get I think it happened to Phil um, it just shows how long that blog post has been up. Um, the blog post was written for the British Council and I was running a training session. Uh, I chose some of the best ELT digital materials around at that time. I divided my group into different um, uh, uh, well, pairs and small groups, gave them an evaluation uh, checklist. That's from my first book. It's a very simple checklist. Uh, they just had to go in, get familiar with those materials and come back and report back. And I was waiting there for the participants to come in and tell me what they thought. Um, this is what they thought. <laughs> I don't know if everyone's happy just to read that through. I'll pause just for a second. So you can see my surprise when the feedback came through. Now that is a very polite blog for the British Council. If you'd like to know what actually happened to me this afternoon, this is a slightly impolite, shorter version, which is I chose what I thought were the best digital materials around. And the teachers who were um, bright, uh, Experienced teachers absolutely annihilated those materials and went into hundreds of reasons why they were awful. And I was absolutely on the floor. But it really did show me that if you are creating digital materials like the one on the top left, you have to remember there are no students in front of you. You are creating those digital materials in a room for an unknown group of students and the teachers in front of you may have a whole range of concerns about using those materials for their particular context and so the importance of context really really came uh, to me and I think that that's a good moment to pause for a second I think there are lots of contexts and I'm actually going to invite you now to type in other contexts into the chat room. Those are a few I've thought of. I don't teach much general English. I certainly don't teach young learners and I don't teach very young learners. Uh, but I do have a career teaching business English and feel very comfortable doing that. ESP, English for Specific Purposes and EAP. I'm happy with that. I'm going to Madrid to teach uh, a course uh, and all the teachers are CLIL teachers. They all teach geography, science, maths in Spanish, con content and language integrated learning. And when I went to India, that was the title of one of the session, uh, the conferences I attended. High tech, I live in Europe, quite used to high tech environments. Low tech and also no tech environments. Those are some contexts. Please feel free to type in any other contexts that come to mind. And I'll just pause just for 10 or 15 seconds to allow you to do that. Yeah, so Eunice has typed in university students. That's very much where I am with EAP, tertiary level materials, but I don't teach secondary, I don't teach primary. Um, and so am I the right person to evaluate those uh, materials? Yeah, trainee teachers, Sue, thank you. It's another a teaching context, a, a training context, in fact. Okay, well, I'm very, very happy for the um, chat to just keep running there. Uh, I'm going to continue, but it's a really nice chance to type in some of the contexts that 
people are working in on this course so you might find you've got a soulmate somewhere else on the course that does something similar so that was the first reason uh, that hit me very uh, strongly uh, this this association between what I thought was good materials and what teachers thought. Here's the second incident. I was in Paris uh, doing a talk for the publisher, Macmillan. Uh, I had um, spoken about In Company. There was a new version that came out and a lady ran up to me and she was actually quite angry. Uh, I don't know if she was angry with me, but the first thing she said was, does Macmillan not employ designers? And she waved the middle book around and she said, I don't like brown. I don't like the color. And I just felt really in a horrible position thinking, is this evaluation of material? Yeah, I mean, you know, I like it. I don't like it. And it made me think, well, to what extent are evaluation subjective? Can we agree on certain things during the course and make these evaluations objective just something to really think about i love movies there's a film peeping tom and those are some of the evaluations that the uh, i the um, website receives the imdb 10 out of 10 was one evaluation you can see on the left somebody else gave it one out of 10 it really makes you think doesn't it it's the same film but what people you know uh, bring to any kind of experience like that could be wildly different and that transfers very much into my work as a teacher with people rushing in saying this is awesome this app and someone else saying don't like it I really don't like it and someone else saying oh yeah but you know my students like it these, these are the kind of issues that uh, we'll be looking at on the course so that was the second incident and here's the third one um, just about a, a, a year and a half ago um, previous to that I'd written um, the chapter online and blended learning in the Routledge handbook of language learning and technology and um, I was asked, would I like to write the chapter evaluating digital materials in the forthcoming book? Um, and I took a deep breath and I said, yeah, OK, that sounds quite interesting. So that's what happened. I went off for two months of my life, went to the university library, found uh, a wealth of information, lots and lots and lots of sources, but from all over the place, inside and outside the LT. And I came to the conclusions there are definitely no easy answers. You can't just simply say, here's the question, how do we do it? Here's the answer. This is how you do it. It's much, much more complicated than that. And at the end of those two months, I thought, wow, I've put such a lot of effort, intellectual effort into trying to understand this question. Could all of that work help anybody else? And that's when I got in touch with ITDI. And um, it's great to talk to them because I think they felt that same kind of excitement. Yes, maybe this could transfer into a course that could be useful so really that's the background of this and I'm going to pause now just again just to see if anybody would like to say something about why they decided to take this course if you want to say something I think you can do that it's probably best if you um, sort of wave to to Phil um, and he'll sort of <laughs> give you permission if you like to say something or just type something into the chat about why you what was your journey why why you decided to just pause and take a month of your life to to do this course yeah so you can type in the chat and you can also unmute yourself if you would like to speak rather than type okay Great. Okay. Well, in the interests of time, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to continue, if that's okay. Uh, just pausing. Um, but just to say, in the introductions that you're writing to yourself about what you do and where you do it, that could be an, something to add to those in, introductions. Um, just what is your, your particular interest and reason for, for doing this course? Okay, I'm going to move on now. Um, 
and we're going to move to the question of evaluation uh, itself. So I can't help but get slightly distracted by the chat, but that's 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 okay. But this is a moment now where we will move on to the question of evaluation. What is evaluation? And again, I'm going to pause just to allow you to type into the chat any particular uh, definition of the verb to evaluate. Uh, please feel free to go ahead, especially if you're um, a lexicographer that's be recently been involved in creating a dictionary and you have a nice definition of uh, evaluate. What do we mean by that term? you to RET. So RET's chosen to analyze and it's based on parameters. Angela, thank you, to look at something from the point of view of its usefulness. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we've got a couple of views there. Um, to analyze, make judgments about something, to decide its usefulness and any other factors per a, a criteria. Yes, who's put to test something's value. I confess I borrowed and stole some things from other people and synthesized them into my own answer as I was typing. <laughs> That, that's all right. I wondered, don't worry, if we live in a world now where we couldn't all just actually just have a very, very quick Google of an online dictionary. And, um, okay, Louise has put to assess and decide if it's, if it's useful, if it's useful or not. So thank you very much. It is a very rich um, concept, I think. If we just take those, some of those definitions, uh, Hugo's written, it's gathering students learning processes and information. So just looking at, at a dictionary, we have judging, calculating the quality, importance, amount or value of something. And the word criteria has already come up. Um, so it can be based on a specific set of uh, criteria standards. If we come away from the ordinary definition now and actually move slightly more towards language teaching, Fred Genesi is the writer. And I, I would just say at this point, these text heavy slides, please don't worry about trying to get all the information now. Uh, Anybody that's mentioned on a slide, there will be a bibliography at the end of the course if anyone wants to chase these up. Um, but basically what Janisi is saying here is, again, collecting, analyzing, interpretation. But what's important in the middle there is to make informed decisions. And I think that's a really important part of uh, the kinds of evaluations that we're doing. Um, looking at language teaching as a whole, it could focus on many, many different aspects of teaching, but particularly teaching and learning textbooks, instructional materials, which is where we're going on this course, student achievement, whole programs of instruction. So you can see how I think that the term itself then moves into language teaching. Um, and just before we look a little bit in more detail at evaluation as a term, um, what do you actually find yourself evaluating in real life? So I've already put up films there. Most of my Facebook posts are from a restaurant. People have noticed I eat a lot and I'm always there. And now, of course, you're invited at the end of your meal to type in your evaluation of the meal into um, TripAdvisor. Uh, so thank you, Eunice. Yet yeah, you could be testing a student's performance. Books, and I think it's the same thing, isn't it, Sue, that on uh, online now you, you can put your star rating next to books on Amazon and, and give, your, uh, give your evaluation. So lots of things that we actually do um, in 
in our own lives in this area of evaluating. Okay, so accommodation. Yes, I've never tried Airbnb yet. <laughs> Wow, if I make movement in shops. So Rhett, I'm guessing that that's connected with what, what people are buying at any given time. Okay, but we're just gonna stay with this term evaluation and we're going to look at evaluation within the literature. And it's funny because Eunice just mentioned testing. I mean, if you test a student, you're assessing the student. And there is no doubt that evaluation, research and assessment are used fairly indiscriminately across the literature so somebody might talk about ah it's the end of the course we have to evaluate our students and someone else is saying yes we're having we have to evaluate them we have to test them so these terms if you like cross over and are used in different ways which is something i think which is normal in in elt so just at this point it's worth un picking them very, very slightly, say so we're focusing on evaluate, evaluation, um, which is often directed towards a particular group. Um, these are often called the stakeholders, so that group might be the people that created the materials, for instance, um, or the designers, for, uh, for example, or they might be looking at the students as stakeholders, how do they feel about materials, so evaluation in this context evaluation of digital materials is very very much decision driven should we use these here or should we use them there so we're not really evaluation which is often more about hypotheses and open-ended questions and we're definitely not looking at evaluating a course in the sense of giving feedback on we're not looking at student levels and you know were they better were they worse and so on that's again is slightly tangential to what we're doing but it's just to, to flag up that when you read stuff they often do uh, cross over and another useful distinction to make just in this first webinar is that difference between formative and summative so uh, summative is probably what a lot of teachers need to do. Here's here's an app. Is it any good for you? And you're looking at the um, the, the actual finished version of of the app. Um, if you're creating those materials, you might constantly be getting feedback and evaluation all the way through the process. So it's quite a useful distinction uh, that we'll meet again on the course. Uh, the difference between formative and summative evaluations okay so we really come to the end of that very short focus on evaluation we're clearly going to unpack that term in great detail linked to digital materials uh, starting from next week um, at this point we are going to move on to digital materials so if i say what are digital materials i definitely need to pause now and i would ask you to just go completely mad in the chat and just start typing in um, anything and everything that for you comes under the heading of digital materials so let me pause and say please go mad in the chat okay and just while you're doing that um I'd just like to let you know that you can reply to everyone in your chat or you can also reply privately to individuals. Uh, so if you've had a private chat with me, you may need to switch back so that your replies do go to everyone and not just to me. Um, there is a blue icon that says two and then a blue box with a drop down menu so you can choose where it goes. Thank you very much, Phil. Okay, so what do people view? CD-ROMs, file, LMS apps, learning apps, interact DVD-ROMs, digital platforms, blogs, vlogs. Great. This is what I thought might happen, that there's lots and lots of things in there. And certainly the great thing about doing this course is that we get a list, I believe, Phil, of all the, the text from the chat. So we can go back and study that 
digital materials, using a computer, yeah, podcasts. Yes, a copy of the chat as well as the recording will be sent to everyone as well, usually within 24 hours of finishing today's session. Great. So I think I'd like to establish that, and I think it has been by you guys. Thank you very much. That there's an awful lot around. There's a lot out there that could come under that heading. Um, I just made a very simplistic uh, distinction there between lots and lots of stuff that's out there uh, that's just authentic, that's nothing to do with language teaching necessarily, and then stuff created for English language teaching. So if we just think of podcasts as authentic podcasts, immediately we can also put podcasts in the bottom box as well and think podcasts created by ELT practitioners to be used with their students. And that's very, very different from a podcast, I think, about financial English and so on. Um, online videos. When we come to web tool tools it's quite interesting because there's lots of tools out there um Pete, peter just mentioned one um today's meet which he as he points out is now closed down but tools for doing stuff so you've got the content of the blog and then you've got the actual blog itself as a as a creation tool so i'm not sure where those tools fit uh, there are lots of tools to create avatars to create cartoons for instance mind mapping software i don't think we're really evaluating those tools on this course but we might find that the results of creation might be something that we want to have a look at. So we might think that the cartoons that have been created by the cartoon creator, if they're printed, it's one thing, it's not really part of this course, but if those are accessible on a device, maybe we think, okay, well, that's something that we might want to assess. When it comes to ELT, so many different things. I mean, if we just stop now and think of the thousands and thousands and thousands of websites out there for English language teaching, they must all be incredibly different. So lots and lots of differences. Um, Clearly interactive exercises. I guess that's really going to figure on this course. I think that's somewhere in my head. Yet yeah, we're, we're ELT people. We've made interactive exercises. So that's going to be part of the course. Ebooks, just as they are, or e-workbooks, such as the one that accompanies Global, uh, that's the Macmillan book um, that Lindsay Clanfield was involved in, where you actually have interaction with the book. And then we've come to the huge area of um, IWBs. And I think on this course, we might find that there'll be very, very few people using interactive whiteboards in their classroom. But of those that do, uh, then clearly some software has been created by the teacher, some may be created by the manufacturer. So that's a huge area that could be extremely important to people. I think I was invited to Greece recently and someone said, Pete, Pete, everyone here uses IWBs, come over and share your views. And I was thinking, wow, that's really different to other contexts where people say, no, 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 absolutely. IWBs have been shown to have failed. So it's really, really interesting. Okay, confession time, guys. I really don't know very much about digital games. And I'll tell you, IATFL, I went to so many sessions about digital games to get ready for this course. Just the whole idea of, you know, is that your environment? And the content of virtual worlds, which is really, really fascinating. And then a hugely problematic area, which is um, the digital material used to assess students' tests. What if we had to evaluate a test uh, that's hugely specific and you might find that you simply don't have the resources. If you had to evaluate the Longman test and you think of the thousands of people doing that, it's quite incredible. So lots of things basically under that heading. I thought I'd just show you a few things that I've been involved in. Um, this is from the business. I wrote this digital exercise. Very, very interesting because it's for the classroom. So you have the classroom incarnation with a big circle on the whiteboard, and then you have the digital materials incarnation, which is completely different. It's not open. You have to do something on this screen, which is closed. That big switch between being in the classroom and just working um, with anything that comes up, like, what do you think about the future? Which is an open question. 
versus what you do on digital materials, which is close everything down so that the machine can give you feedback. Um, I was responsible for presenting the uh, Macmillan Interactive Whiteboard software and I was in a meeting where the people that made this course book were in the same room as the people that created the whiteboard software and there was a gigantic battle which it started off, that's our book, that's our book, what are you doing with our book? And the, all these other people, the digital people coming in and saying, well, these are the IWB tools and just that incredible moment when digital meets um, print. And here's uh, something from the Macmillan English campus. I evaluated the campus for my uh, master's dissertation. Um, the whole point of the campus is to look at it holistically. You have to look at everything together, but there was no doubt that some people love the games and the pressure grew and grew and grew and grew. Can we just have the games? And so suddenly um, Macmillan were forced to pull the games off this dynamic platform and burn them onto one CD-ROM and say, here's the game. But are you looking at lots and lots of games in this context or just this one game? Um, so that's really quite interesting. And thinking a lot about this for me sometimes it's very easy isn't it to say that's analog here's my pencil i write it uh, the meeting in my diary here's digital you know you look at that you have to have a computer but perhaps there's also a bit of a gray area we might meet it on this course where you go here's your homework basically your homework's a sheet of paper which is analog but in the corner of the paper there's a qr code to so scan it with your phone and then you'll be able to go to the listening, which the listening is digital. So you've got this area in the middle, maybe, which is um, not quite as clear. And when we look at digital materials, just look at the people on this course. Where will you be? Uh, just looking at one tiny exercise. There's an exercise on the left of your screen. I think it's on the left of your screen. It's on the left of my screen. And it's mostly white space. That was a, an exercise made in a program called Hot Potatoes, which some of you may be familiar with. And anyone evaluating that would probably say, goodness me, there's too much white space there. That's absolutely awful. That was just an attempt to make uh, that exercise but the exercise is actually quite good um, but clearly the way it looks maybe isn't uh, we come down to interactive exercises on a cd-rom and how at this end of the scale if you're involved in a project like this you do have many people working with you people filming people directing the films people creating the digital materials so on the right, you have very rich, complex projects. Uh, so it's all digital material, but a very, very, very big difference between the left and the right of the screen. Um, so you could have one exercise, but just think how that is going to have to be displayed in all those different mediums. You know, the exercise on CD-ROM or DVD-ROM has got a bigger um, uh, memory space but then those materials recently were had to be repurposed for the the web um, they would make it again have to be repurposed for use on the tablets the same exercise and that's not going to show very well on a tiny screen like this so even though you've got one exercise type uh, clearly there's a very strong link between where people are using it so all of these things are going to come up and um, this is a complete list a total taxonomy of digital exercise types which uh, you can find on um, the English 360 platform and I must say that the English 360 platform is now not available. Uh, it's actually ceased to be uh, over the last few, um, I think, months or so. Now that's not around, but still that list is very, very interesting for looking at exercises in digital. So I'm going to pause now and just say, wow, we've been looking at what digital materials are. Clearly, there's a lot of different things out there. You might be familiar with some, not others. Um, but I'll just pause just for a moment in case anybody wants to um, ask a specific question. People have already made some comments there. 
Yeah, the growth has been phenomenal. Okay, what I'm going to do now is just to move to the very last part of this, um, this webinar. And I was shocked the other day in a teacher training session when I asked the participants, what does CALL stand for? C-A-L-L, -L, CALL. And somebody put their hand up and actually said, well, they didn't do this, obviously, but they said, I don't know. But that's what I met, a teacher who didn't know what call was. Because if you think about it, you join the profession at a certain time. So what you see is what's around you. And you just may not have that, if you like, historical overview of how we reached the moment that we, we have reached now. You might not have lived through all those generations beforehand. And I think we can't afford to do that evaluating digital materials we have to know where some of these come from so here is a the world's shortest um, history of digital materials so here's a quiz guys i'm going to show you five things from different historical points i suggest that you get <clears throat> a pen or a pencil because there are five letters a b c d e and you've got to put these into the correct order and i would highly recommend as someone from the digital uh, from the analog age just having a piece of paper write down your order and then type it into the chat so there is a virtual bar of chocolates for the winner are you ready to start the quiz guys okay here are five things in the history of uh, digital materials Put them in order and type your answer in. Obviously, Phil uh, can't answer because he has actually seen the next slide, which is the answer sheet. Yeah, I actually saw it, but I didn't absorb it. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Sue, Sue, if you have the right answer, CDBAE, uh, then you're going to get the virtual chocolate. And the great thing is uh, I'll probably be able to give you the real bar of chocolate uh, now, that's interesting because Angela's answer is very slightly different. C-B-A-D-E. Mariana, hi, hello. A-C-D-B-E. And Eunice has a different answer as well. That's fantastic for me because I just know, okay, <laughs> there's lots of different sequences out there. And it means I'm now going to show you the answer. If um, So don't worry. Um, Pete Clemens, Snickers, please. Peter, it would be the world's uh, most expensive bar of Snickers in terms of air miles. But if I came over to <laughs> Thailand to deliver your prize, I'd be very, very happy to do so. But there's the right answer. Uh, so Muesli, um, you can see the very first cover of Muesli there from 1984. I'll always remember the second one because that's when my daughter was born. Um, the The... The next one, of course, I'll remember because I went to, to, uh, to Japan to launch uh, my book on CD-ROM. 2010, it's amazing, isn't it? It didn't exist, the iPad, and suddenly it existed, and suddenly it became a must-have item, which is incredible. And Oculus, sorry, that should say Oculus Go. That's the latest uh, headset. Uh, we don't now need a, um, a smartphone in it. You don't need it linked to a computer but that just came out this year the actual standalone it's called very very big in china now but um so that's an oculus go headset so that's just to give you a, a flavor of some of those seminal moments in the past you know the birth of google and so on so let's look at call computer assisted language learning computer aided language learning very very big term in the literature um but of course less so in the classroom um, because call is tainted with a little bit of a historical old-fashioned feel. If call is computer, uh, what is ball? If you'd like to type in your guess for ball, uh, don't type in 
assisted language learning, just type in what you think the B stands for. Computer assisted language learning. Ball is, see if anyone wants to make a guess. Um, blended, I oh, love it, I love it, but it's not. It's actually book, book assisted language learning. Paul, P A L L, any guesses for the P? We have book assisted language learning. P is, it's not pronunciation, it's actually P for pen. Pen assisted language learning. And it was a comment made, uh, I think, by, possibly by Stephen Bax, it'll come up in a moment, uh, as just showing we took the computer and we put it in a special room. We took it out of language learning as a whole, put it in a different place, and made call. But we never took the book out of language learning we never had a special term for that we never had a special term for Paul Pe pen assisted language learning we do have more now which is actually mobile assisted language learning um, which is which is something that will come up in on this course but it's quite interesting uh, just that whole idea of the computer was so different it changed our lives so much it became special so here we go a short assist a short history of core materials the great thing is this is a reading text, so you can digest this uh, in your own time. But I'm just going to sum up by telling you that Mark Vorschau, sorry if I didn't get that quite right, has written Dividing Call into three stages. And then the first one is structural or behaviorist. The second, communicative. And the third, integrative. And when I um, did my master's in educational technology. I'd never heard of Mark Varshava. I was a teacher who taught in a classroom. I've done my diploma, but I'd never heard of him. So suddenly when you switch into looking at the theory, you meet a whole different set of names, different people who are researching. And um, it's not the only list of, um, of if you like historical periods. Stephen Bax sadly no longer with us. Um, he talked about a different set of headings, basically the computer restricting your answer and then not having fewer restrictions. And then finally, his last uh, uh, um, period where the technology is normalized, he's actually said, we haven't got there yet. My glasses are normalized. I don't think about, I don't even think it's a technology because I use it all the time. Now, I'm not sure about that now. It's an interesting thing to think about. Maybe this is normalized. Maybe the plenaries at Tiatefel at the end was suggesting now, you know, people have a smartphone, but can we, can we say everyone has a smartphone? I don't know. It's something to think about. But if we look at the very first period of call, look at that screen. That's what it was about. Fill in the blank. Close progress. You've only got one answer. You know, you can choose A, B, C or D. And what's so important is, of course, this kind of digital material exists today, but it existed then. Then things moved to communication between people. You have communicative call. So here you've got somebody like me, that guy there, got his, just like me, got his headset communicating with somebody else. So the computer's there. It's in the middle of some kind of rich communication. So Ippy Hockley, who's a great writer and practitioner in this area, talks about, you know, just using language to communicate, but more in open-ended situations, things like using the computer for sending emails. This whole idea that um, the older structural call was old-fashioned, but now it reflects a communicative approach. So one of the big, big things to come up at this point was this important, critical distinction as to whether the computer is a tutor or a tool. And if it's a tutor, it's trying to teach you something. And I noticed in the forum, somebody was speaking about um, one of the new adaptive learning uh, bits of 
digital material but again if that's adapting to you but it's trying to teach you giving you some kind of feel feedback it's very 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 different to the word processor which just operates as a tool and that distinction will come again and again and again throughout our course so this idea of communication so the playing some kind of game this was all very very uh, world famous uh, interesting um, uh, kind of early game um, which is more computer based uh, more sorry communicatively based integrative basically the key thing here is that it's not just grammar it's actually graphics photographs video text and sound speech all these things integrated so you can do listening you can do reading you can do writing much much more than just the very early grammar programs so cd-roms with course books have more multimedia than ever before okay so i'm just going to finish off now with uh, some of the more recent developments one is tell technology enhanced language learning and um, here technology has really um, if you like become part and parcel of what we do as language teachers these kinds of uh, materials are now available very much more on the web rather than just doing it from a disc at the back of the book now we're living in the age of mobile assisted language learning which is not so easy to define because in some senses mobile if, the, if your students are running around outside using their smartphones in a treasure hunt that's kind of mobile obviously your device your smartphone is mobile but this whole idea of learning experiences which are mobile is something that's very very interesting and um, what we're experiencing at the moment so let's just finish off now by saying computers have changed over the years and this change we'll see as we look in more detail at evaluation that at the beginning people went ah oh, we have to use computers and they were constantly trying to look at situations where the teacher just teaches then the teacher teaches with computers you know is it better it was like we have to justify it now we don't have to worry about all of those comparative um, studies a lot of which came to the conclusion that there's no major difference which is quite a surprise um, into just using uh, digital materials and let's bring ourselves right up to date with what's being debated at the moment i know katrin is in this uh, in this course very much like myself as somebody very interested in ar and vr augmented reality these are the, some of the things we might find ourselves having to evaluate so that really brings me to the end of this short history of uh, digital materials and also it brings me really to the end of our first webinar as well um, that's what I hope we've done this afternoon, if I may say, could be this morning, could be this evening. Um, just looked at reasons why this course exists. The term itself, evaluation and all the kinds of uh, connotations that it has. And we've discovered, I think, really that digital materials is just so wide we might want to focus in on something and if we're going to evaluate these materials it is actually important to have a historical perspective on this so um, I don't know what connotations the word homework has for you I'm sure I hope it's not too negative but I hope you'll enjoy doing this week's task which is just have a think yourself about whether you want to just evaluate one exercise whether you want to evaluate a suite of exercise lots of different things spend time if you want if you've got time and you want to evaluate different materials that's fine but have a think about it it would be great if what you evaluate you don't know yourself so in other words if you do work for say wall street i know we have a lot of participants from wall street you might decide okay i won't evaluate wall street materials on this course because i kind of know them i'll evaluate something else and maybe you could pass on a link to your materials to someone else on the course and they could evaluate them so that's your forum task just post what it is you've chosen to evaluate what it is so that others can know but 
don't be judgmental in any way just say what they are in a very cold way and why you chose it so there'll be plenty of time i hope at the end of the week to go up to that forum have a look at what other people are going to evaluate and just make a comment like whoa awesome really interested in this and then if that short history of call was too short then you've got a chance to just read through the original article um, or one of the many many contributions that mark has made so i'm looking forward to seeing you guys in the forum i'm sorry we've overrun by possibly 90 seconds uh, very very bad for the presenter but i've got a lot to go through and i'm just happy to say it's been great to see you guys um, here and um, enjoy the week uh, we'll be in touch during the week and I will be delighted and hope to see you next week. So I'll stand, hand over to Phil just to close the, uh, the webinar now. Thank you, Phil. Thanks to everybody. All right. Thank you very much, Pete. That was fantastic. Right. Fascinating. Pleasure. Uh, uh, yes, just to let everybody know, uh, virtual claps for Pete. I, you can either put your mic on or we don't have the clap symbol in the <laughs> know where that is we had it on the adobe but we'll see what we can come up with uh the homework assignments just so everyone's uh, sure about it the they will be sent out usually an email along with the recordings and also they are posted in the forums so you'll be able to check what they are there and we make slides available too right okay Thank you very much once again, everyone. I will hold the room open just a few more minutes, but other than that, you are free to go. And the recordings will be sent out as well. Uh, I'm just going to stop the recording now, okay?